Howdy, I'm Jay Whitmer, cardiology fellow here at Mayo Clinic Rochester. During today's recording, we'll be discussing sleep apnea, its impact on the cardiovascular system, treatment options, and I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Dr. Varen Summers, who is an expert both in cardiovascular diseases and sleep apnea. Welcome, Dr. Summers. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. So we'll get started. So briefly tell us a little bit about sleep apnea. What is it and uh, why does this occur? So, so when you think of sleep apnea, there's really two essential types, there's obstructive apnea and central apnea. Obstructive apnea is the kind of apnea that's noisy, socially disruptive, associated with snoring. Patients are often obese um, and generally affects males, uh, but also affects females, maybe a, a two to one ratio. And the apnea occurs because when people fall asleep, they lose their postural muscle tone. Mm -hmm. And uh, because the upper airway has striated muscle, uh, it loses tone in the upper airway as well. Okay. So particularly during REM or dream sleep, when you really want to have low muscle tone so you don't act out your dreams, you end up having a very lax upper airway because of the loss of muscle tone. And so with inspiration, the airway collapses causes an obstruction and uh, the resolution of the obstruction occurs when the patient's brain wakes up. The patient doesn't know he or she's waking up, but the brain wakes up, the muscle tone's restored, they start breathing again. So that's obstructive apnea. Central apnea is the more quiet kind of apnea, the apnea that occurs with heart failure. You'll also see it in your kids or your spouse when you travel to altitude. Mm. Uh, the low carbon dioxide that's generated by being at altitude causes a central apnea. And um, it's also known, we, we know it also as chain strokes breathing. Okay. So it's, it's a non-obstructive apnea and the apnea occurs because of the lack of the central drive to breathe. So we see that mainly in heart failure, you see it in normal people at the altitude. You will also see it in premature infants. They often have a high likelihood of central apnea. So you've got obstructive, which is the noisy, a uh, kind of apnea, you've got central, which occurs particularly with severe heart failure, again occurs mainly in males, but the difference is that the central apnea and heart failure tends to be more prominent in um, people with, with low body weight, low muscle mass, more cardiac cachectic. They will often have central apnea. Interesting, so you mentioned heart failure and some central sleep apnea. Yes. With regard to those two types of sleep apnea, yeah. are there any that are particularly associated with cardiovascular disease or do they cause cardiovascular disease? Good question, so let's talk about obstructive first. Um, obstructive is associated with a breadth of cardiovascular diseases, hypertension, uh, atrial fibrillation, um, myocardial ischemia, particularly the ischemia that occurs at night. If people wake from sleep with chest pain, think mm -hmm. about obstructive sleep apnea. Heart attacks, particularly heart attacks occurring at night. If someone has a heart attack, chest pain occurred at night, look for obstructive apnea. High likelihood that he or she has obstructive apnea. The other thing that sleep apnea has been, obstructive apnea has been linked to is sudden death. Um, there seems to be an increased risk of sudden death in people with obstructive apnea and there's also an increased risk of sudden death and defibrillator firing that occurs at night. So if a patient has an ICD and it triggers at night, wakes him from sleep, then look for, uh, look for sleep apnea. Sleep apnea, both ischemic and non-ischemic uh, causes? Yes, absolutely, oh, okay. absolutely. And, and so, the, so the, the, but the, the more important question you asked, or at least the other important question you asked is, does sleep apnea cause the heart disease? We don't know for sure. There's, there's, there's good evidence suggesting it does cause it and certainly makes it worse, but we haven't got the definitive answer to that yet. I think the best we can do at this point is say sleep apnea probably is a cause of high blood pressure. Excellent. The rest of it, it's, uh, it, 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 the jury's still out. Now let's talk about central apnea. Mm -hmm. Central apnea, things are less clear. Uh, Patients with central apnea and heart failure, the central apnea seems to be uh, an accompaniment of the heart failure. Okay. Whether the central apnea is causing the heart failure to become worse, we don't know, uh, probably not based on, on, on evidence that emerged recently, which we will talk about. Right, excellent. Yeah. So, 
We talked a little bit about ischemic heart disease and heart failure. Are there any other cardiovascular uh, conditions that would be associated with sleep apnea or we need to think about sleep apnea? Well, I think, I think uh, in those cardiovascular conditions that, that we mentioned, I think if the patient has intractable hypertension or recurrent atrial fibrillation, uh, then you, or, or heart failure that's not responsive to standard therapy, then you must look for, for sleep apnea because often or sometimes treating the apnea can make the underlying cardiovascular condition more amenable to, 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 to being treated with drugs or, or standard therapy. Now, things that I haven't mentioned, yeah, it, um, uh, aneurysmal dilatation of the iota has been linked to obstructive oh. sleep apnea. Patients with pulmonary emboli, uh, they've been, they, they, they seem to have a higher prevalence of sleep apnea than we'd expect. Certainly patients with DVT have a high prevalence of sleep apnea. Now, uh, some work that, that came uh, from, from us at Mayo showed that um, uh, if you have a PFO uh, and you have a, a left to right shunt generally, during the, during the obstructive apnea, during the Muller maneuver, you can actually get reversal of the shunt. So you get right. a right to left shunt. So if you think if you have a, a, a DVT that's embolized up to the, to, the, to the right atrium and suddenly you get a change due to the obstructive apnea from left to right to right to left shunting, you can get a paradoxical embolus. So these are the more esoteric things that are linked to, to, to sleep apnea. It's certainly something we all need to be thinking about in the, in the clinical realm. Absolutely. Uh, so in terms of treatment options for sleep apnea, what are some of the treatment options and what are their impact really on, on the cardiovascular disease? You mentioned a little bit earlier about treating hypertension and so forth, but what are some of the ways that we can treat it and, and then how is that gonna help our patients? Sure. So, so we'll start with obstructive apnea and treatment options for obstructive apnea, if the patient's overweight, you want them to, to lose weight. Um, if they have sleep apnea that's worse on their backs, uh, it's, it's very much a gravitational thing because if there's loss of muscle tone in the upper airway, the tongue can fall backwards into the airway. That's worse when they sleep on their backs, and this is why patients with apnea are often improved if they sleep on their sides. So that's something else you can do. And how do we do that? You can get a, a T-shirt with tennis balls sewn in, so when they sleep on their backs, they're uncomfortable, so they sleep over on their sides. That can help relieve apnea to some extent. Um, uh, the, 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 there's several other approaches we could talk about, but I think probably the gold standard of sleep apnea therapy is CPAP, or continuous positive airway pressure. Right. And what that does is splints the airway open during inspiration, so it makes it easier for the subject to breathe. Um, there are new uh, investigational therapies on the horizon for, for example, obstructive sleep apnea. There is a, um, a stimulator for the nerves that control the upper airway so that when you have an apnea, those, the stimulator activates and maintains airway tone. And again, that's fairly experimental. There have been some papers on it uh, suggestive of, of, of you know, reasonable results, but we have to wait and see. Central apnea is uh, uh, you, the, the, probably the, the, the optimal way to treat central apnea is what we call adaptive servo ventilation. It's kind of a, 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 a CPAP-like device that in, in, in a simplistic way kind of learns your breathing when you're awake and breathing normally and tries to simulate that kind of breathing pattern when you're asleep okay. to stabilize your breathing. So if you think, CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure, is a pressure-driven breathing aid. Okay. ASV, or adaptive solar ventilation, seeks to maintain the volume of airflow. Mm. And so when you stop breathing, it's not a question of the airway collapsing, it's just that you're not breathing. So this thing tries to generate the breathing for you. Now, you, you did ask, what's the effects of therapy? I'm going to... Uh, talk about uh, obstructive apnea first. We do know that treating um, obstructive apnea in hypertensive patients, particularly those with severe sleep apnea and with severe hypertension who are sleepy, will lower blood pressure. How does uh, treating sleep apnea do in terms of increasing lifespan? We've had a, a fairly large study, the SAFE study, come out in the New England Journal uh, a few months ago, and those results were, were a little disappointing because when they treated people with 
established cardiovascular disease, uh, randomized some to CPAP treatment and the others to usual care without mm -hmm. CPAP. Uh, the ones getting CPAP didn't really show any striking improvement in outcome. Now, there are many possible explanations for this. One is they only took non-sleepy patients. And what we've learned over the years is it's the sleepy obstructive apneics who seem to be at greatest risk. Mm -hmm. So there's something about having obstructive apnea and being sleepy that actually confers risk. Whether the, the cause of the sleepiness is also the cause of the cardiovascular problem, we don't know. But okay. it certainly is an interesting thing yeah. uh, to think about. So this study, unfortunately, did not include sleepy patients. Uh, what they did find, though, was that in those people who used their CPAP diligently, who used them for, for a significant part of the night, there was a, a strong suggestion towards better outcomes. Okay. So the question is, you know, although the, the randomization of CPAP uh, didn't work on an intention-to-treat basis, perhaps using CPAP more diligently with better adherence may give you a better outcome. We don't know that for sure. Interesting. And let's talk about central apnea, because okay. those results are more clear. And this is a study that I was involved in. Uh, it was called serve hf mm -hmm. where we had about uh, 1,300 patients with uh, predominant central apnea and low ejection fraction heart failure. So mm -hmm. EFs were less than 45%. We randomized them to either ASV, which is good for treating central apnea, and, or no ASV. And our expectation was that ASV would improve outcomes. Well, it turned out it actually did not improve outcomes mm -hmm. in heart failure patients with low ejection fraction who also have central sleep apnea. In fact, what we found was an increase in cardiovascular mortality in the treated group. So what does that tell us? It tells us that maybe we shouldn't be treating central sleep apnea in low ejection fraction heart failure with ASV. Whether treating it with other methods makes a difference, we don't know. Correct. But to clarify, we want to, I want to be very clear that this does not apply to, to patients with normal ejection heart failure. Right. If you have a normal ejection fraction and you have heart failure, um, there's, you know, we, we still have to figure out if, if ASV is good for you or not. Good to know, good to know. So a lot of different treatment options. Yeah. And certainly a yeah. lot of things to go through in terms of diagnosis, uh, risk right. stratification, comorbidities, and then and then looking at what option is Absolutely. best for patients. Yeah. yeah. Well, great. Well, this has been very instructive. Thank you for, You're very uh, welcome. for, Thank, for, uh, for giving us these insights. Uh, so <clears throat> thank you for joining us today on the heart.org on Medscape.